I want to join with Brother Roper in telling you that we really do believe we're off to a remarkable beginning for this series of lectures, the Lord willing, which will last through this coming Thursday night. And we trust that everybody here can so arrange their schedules to be back again and again, if not every single time, that we have a passage that we will be discussing or some related theme to the Old Testament being discussed, as I said, beginning now and going through this coming Thursday night. So from the bottom of the hearts of all of us here at Brown Trail, we say thank you for being here and how we look forward to seeing you from time to time as this week progresses. There are three letters in the word old, and there are nine letters in the word testament. You put those together, and that composes the numeral 39. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. There are three letters in the word new, and there are nine letters in testament. This time, multiply the three and the nine, and the answer is 27. And there are 27 books in the New Testament. There is the Old Testament, and there is the New Testament. Second Timothy chapter 2 and 15 says, But study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that's the King James rendering. The American Standard rendering in the place of rightly dividing the word says, handling aright the word of truth. And as is the case so often, these two translations really serve as a commentary one on the other. We mean by that that the way to handle or write the Word of God is to rightly divide it. Now, this division of the Bible into the Old Testament section and into the New Testament section is not just an arbitrary division, but rather it is a biblical division. That's why 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6 says, Who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But in verse 14, Paul said, For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So there we have the biblical division of the sacred canon, and that is, we have the New Testament, and we have uh, the Old Testament. Now, in this series of lectures, as you very well know, we are dedicating our time to a study of the Old Testament. And indeed, the Old Testament should be, yea, must be studied. In John chapter 5 and 39, Jesus says, Search the Scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, for they are they which testify of me. And in the context he says, For if ye had have believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for Moses did speak or write of me. So then, as far as the primary emphasis of the text is concerned, our Lord is exhorting us to search the Scriptures, that is, to search the Old Testament Scriptures. There are various parts of the New Testament that can never be fully appreciated unless we have studied in that avidly our Old Testaments. For example, Luke 17 and 32 says, Remember Lot's wife. But we can't do very much remembering of Lot's wife unless we know something about the Old Testament. Again, in the book of Jude, verse 11, we read where the apostle said, Here are those who have gone after the era of uh, Balaam, and after the way of Cain, and have also been guilty of the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. But what we know, would we know of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and of Balaam, and of Cain, unless we knew something about the Old Testament Scriptures? And thus it has so accurately been observed on a number of occasions that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and that the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Or as someone else expressed it, in the Old Testament we have the New Testament contained, and in the New Testament we have the Old Testament explained. 
And so then it is very appropriate in this series of studies this week for us to dedicate our time to the Old Testament. Now, the challenge of the present hour is to discuss, first of all, the inspiration, and then secondly, the purpose, and thirdly, the duration, and then fourthly, the profit of uh, the Old Testament. Now, first of all, we dedicate our time to a study of the inspiration of uh, the Old Testament. In our study of the inspiration of the Old Testament, I would like for us, first of all, to observe some preliminary observations. The Bible, and that includes the Old Testament, of course, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 15 through 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible is the results of revelation plus inspiration. But now, since the Old Testament is involved in that, then we're very accurate when we say that. The Old Testament is the result of revelation plus inspiration. Now, revelation has to do with the making known, the impartation of the will of God, the making known of the will of God from his omniscient, infinite mind. For example, how did Moses know in the beginning God spoke the world into existence? He wasn't there. He did not come to know about that by means of observation. There was but one way that God, uh, that Moses could have known how the world came into existence, and that was by divine impartation. Revelation has to do then with the making known of the omniscient mind, the omniscient will of Almighty God. Now, inspiration has to do with the accurate reception of the revelation and the transmission of the revelation. That transmission may be by verbally giving it, or it may be by having been in, put in written form, and that in a verbal way as we shall subsequently see. So the revelation may be given orally, or it may be given in written form. Now, you put these together, and what really is the result? The Old Testament, my friends, came to be because to the penmen thereof, to the inspired writers thereof, God imparted, God revealed his omniscient will and mind. But that within itself was not sufficient. God then in the exercise of his omnipotence saw that these to whom he made the revelation, that they accurately received and then when they spoke it or when they wrote it, he saw that out of the background of their own personalities, the exact word was chosen to make known the mind that had been revealed. So that we can say the Old Testament is the results of revelation plus inspiration. That being true then, when you and I today come to open our Bibles and to read the sacred content therein, we are reading unmistakably and assuredly the very mind and will of Almighty God. And that's why this is not a book among books, but that's why we can say, my friends, this is the book of books. This is the book that contains the very mind of Almighty God. Alexander Campbell said that when he opened his Bible to study it, he always opened the pages thereof to study it as if it had just fallen from the hand of Almighty God. He wasn't far off. So let's never treat, treat this book lightly or as if it is simply one among many. The Old Testament then is inspired. Some preliminary observations. But let's go a step further. Relative to the inspiration of the Old Testament, let us exhaust the possibilities of the same. The Old Testament, yea, the Bible as a whole, is the product of either good men and or angels, bad men and or devils, or of God. Now, you can take off on all sorts of directions, and you can have all sorts of periphery and all of that, but when it is all boiled down, the Bible came from 
good men and our angels, bad men and our devils, or it came from God. Now, did good men and our angels give us the Bible, particularly in this series of studies, the Old Testament? Such could never have been the case. Why? For according to Jeremiah 1 and verses 7 through 9, and Jeremiah 31 through, uh, 31 through 34, the Bible claims to be the Word of God. But if it is not the Word of God, but simply the product of the fertile mind of man, then we have the Bible filled with lies. And good men don't lie. So then you can simply check off number one as not being the answer. Well, did bad men or angels give us the Bible, particularly the Old Testament? If so, how do we account for the book of Psalms chapter 19 and verse 7, where we find this psalm is saying, and... Um, Every nation that forgets God and all that do iniquity shall be cast into hell. It's the very nature of the personality to exonerate self. But here we find wicked people being cast into hell. If wicked men gave us the Bible, how do we account for that? In the second place, how could wicked men have given to the world that uh, code of moral ethics found in the book of Exodus chapter 20? Wherein it is said, Thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not uh, kill, and thou shalt not commit adultery. How did this code of moral conduct ever originate in the depraved, wicked mind of evil men? So I think you can see the fact that wicked men did not give us the Bible. If these three possibilities exhaust the possibilities, and we have seen that good men and their angels did not give us the Bible, and if bad men and their devils did not give us the Bible, there is but one alternative, and that is that the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, my friends, came from God, the inspiration of the Old Testament. But now relative to that thought, let us also see that uh, the writers of the Old Testament claimed inspiration. Now relative to their claims, there are what we call inferential or implicit testimony, and there is the explicit testimony that indeed they were writing and preaching under the inspiration of God the Almighty. For example, relative to inferential testimony, we mean by that, that that is taken for granted, or that that is inherent in the very passage itself. And in the book of Psalms 119 and in verses 8 and 9, the psalmist said, Thy word, O Lord, is settled in heaven. Inferred in that is inspiration. Again, in the book of Isaiah, we read in chapter 40 and verse 8 that God's word shall stand forever. Inferred in that, inherent in that, is the concept of inspiration. But now look at the explicit testimony of the word of God relative to the fact that it is the inspired revelation of the omniscient mind of Almighty God. Over 2,000 times, Bible writers affirm that they were speaking and writing under the influence of God Himself. In the second place, we observe that that broken down just a little, that there are 1,300 references in the prophets alone relative to the fact that these men spake as they were inspired by Almighty God. Isaiah 1 and verse 10, for example, explicitly says these words. Hear the word of the Lord. Isaiah, what are you doing? I am preaching the word of God. I am writing the word of God. Thus he would say, hear the word of God. Jeremiah would say in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4 of the book that bears his name, the word of the Lord came unto me. Again, the book of Amos chapter 3 and verse 1 says, Now this is the word of the Lord. So here you have these explicit statements that are affirming that these who spoke and these who wrote indeed did so under the inspiration of Almighty God. That's why then David said in the book of 2 Samuel 23 and 2 that the Spirit of the Lord spake one, spake by me two, and his word three was in my tongue four. Now that's inspiration. In fact, as we shall subsequently see, that's verbal inspiration. 2 Thessalonians, 2 Samuel 23 and verse 2. 
But now relative to the fact that the Old Testament is the inspired revelation of God Almighty, not only do we see that such was inferentially uh, asserted and explicitly asserted, but we see that these who thus wrote and these who thus spoke claimed verbal inspiration. I mean by that, that their revelation was given unto man according to the very words that God chose and thus that God spoke. That being true again, listen carefully. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me and his words. Not words that I chose out of my own, out of my own ingenuity, but his words were in my tongue. Again, that's verbal inspiration. In the book of Jeremiah, we read in chapter uh, 25 and verse 13 these words. And I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book. Now, what's written in the book? God says, my words, not my thoughts, but my words. The Bible claims verbal inspiration. Thus we can appreciate the book of Exodus chapter 4 and in verses 12 through 15, wherein God spake unto Moses and said, But go thy way, for I will be with thy mouth, and I will teach thee what thou shalt say. Again, that's verbal inspiration. But not only do the Old Testament writers affirm inspiration, but we also come to see that the inspiration of the Old Testament was affirmed by Christ. It's very interesting to observe that in the book of Matthew chapter 22, that our Lord was speaking to the Sadducees of his day and says, But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read? Now watch that terminology, have ye not read? Have you not read that which was spoken, that which was spoken unto you by God? And then he goes and he quotes Exodus 3 and 6, where God said to Moses, the burning bush, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Our God is not the God of the dead, but he is the God of the living. Now you put all that together, and here's what the text says. God spoke, but now... God even spoke to the Sadducees and had a message for them when he spoke to Moses at the burning bush, says the passage. Then the text says, what God spoke to Moses at the burning bush was put in a written form, inherited in the term, have you not read? Then Jesus says, when God spoke and he spoke to Moses and the message was put in written form, he says, now when you read it, what are you reading? He says, you are reading the very word or mind of God. But that was an Old Testament passage. And our Lord is doing the speaking. So our Lord is putting his seal of approval upon the inspiration of the New Testament scriptures. That being true, then we can better appreciate why he said in the book of Luke chapter 24 and in verse 44, these words which I speak unto you must needs be fulfilled. Now what does he say concerning these words? These must needs be fulfilled, which were written, now watch carefully, which were written in the law of Moses, historical books thereof, and in the Psalms, historical section thus represented, or the poetical section, and in the prophets. Now, when you think of the historical section of the Old Testament, and you think of the poetical section of the Old Testament, and you think of the prophetical section of the Old Testament, that's the entire sacred Old Testament canon. And yet our Lord says all things are written therein, in the law, in the Psalms, in the prophets concerning me must be fulfilled. Here is our Lord affirming the inspiration of the Old Testament. And then we can observe how that such was also affirmed by the apostles. Time will not be generous enough with us at all to deal with this in a way in full. But just observe briefly. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and in verses 2, 16, 17, and 18, Paul quotes four Old Testament passages. 
And every time he introduces them by one of these statements, and God said, or, and the Lord Almighty said. What is Paul doing? Paul is affirming the inspiration of the Old Testament passages to which he makes reference. No wonder then that Peter would say in 1 Peter 1, 10 and 12, the Spirit of Christ which was in them, Old Testament prophets, when it did signify beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. No wonder he said again in 2 Peter chapter 1, 20 and 12, 21, knowing this first that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. But he says, Holy men of God spake as they were moved, borne along under the influence of, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Here he is affirming the inspiration of the Old Testament canon. Now the evidences of the Old Testament's inspiration internally are overwhelming. There is its unity. There is its diversity. There is its historical, geographical, and scientific accuracy. There is its pre-scientific foreknowledge. There is its impartiality. There is its brevity. There are, uh, there are to be found therein its many prophetic utterances. All of these bespeak the fact that the book that has these particular characteristics must be the product of a supernatural being and did not originate in the fertile mind and imagination of man. These are the internal evidences of the Old Testament's inspiration. Again, I will no way at all be able to deal with all of these internal evidences, so we simply select one. I believe to be one of the most convincing evidences of the Bible's inspiration, that particular one being prophetic fulfillment. In Isaiah 44, 48, and 45, 1 through 5, Isaiah, 160 years before he was ever born, said a man would arise and would be actually God's shepherd, though wicked, to deliver his people from Babylonian captivity and even gave the man his name 160 years before it occurred. None other than Cyrus. Add to that in the book of Isaiah, chapter 13, Isaiah said, Though Babylon is the lady of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency, in spite of all of that, she shall become like dust. That prophecy has been fulfilled to the dotting of an eye and the crossing of the T. Consider the fact that there are some 333 specific details relative to the life of our Lord that are related to us in the Old Testament canon, all of which again have been fulfilled to the dotting of I and the crossing of the T. Look at all those prophecies relative to the coming of the kingdom. Daniel tells you even when it will come to pass. He tells you to be while the Roman Empire is in full sway. Again, Daniel 2 and 44. And it came to pass. For when the Roman Empire was in full sway, our Lord indeed established his uh, unshakable kingdom. These are but four illustrations of Old Testament prophecy and their corresponding fulfillment. All be speaking the fact of what? That the Bible indeed, particularly here, the Old Testament, is the inspired revelation of Almighty God. Now, in our study today, our challenge is fourfold. The inspiration of the Old Testament. We have observed some preliminary considerations. We have observed an exhaustion of the possibilities from whence the Old Testament came and has seen it can be none other than God. We have observed the Old Testament writers affirmed its inspiration. We have seen that Jesus affirmed it. We have seen that the apostles affirmed it. And we have seen that such can be substantiated by the many internal evidences therein. Now we leave that. And we observe in the second place today that there was a purpose to the Old Testament. The inspiration and purpose of the Old Testament. In the book of Romans chapter 3 and 20, we have an explicit statement relative to the purpose of the Old Testament scriptures. Therein Paul says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Then in Romans 7 and verse 7 he says, what shall we conclude then? Is the law sin? God forbid. For I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not keep it. Now add to that Galatians chapter 3 and 16 through 19, and therein Paul says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, 
till the seed should, seed should come and was ordained by angels of the hand of a mediator. Now, all three of these texts say that the law is related to sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. I had not known sin except the law had said. The law was added because of transgression. Now, what's the purpose of the Old Testament Scriptures? The purpose of the Old Testament Scriptures, per the emphases of these passages, is to bring unto men a knowledge of sin. To bring unto men a knowledge of, first, the reality of sin, the nature of sin, and the consequences of sin. Now, all of that would have a corresponding effect, and that is, man would come to see as never before his great need of a Savior. That was one of the purposes of the old law. A number of people in the audience today can very well relate and remember these uh, uh, observations. Do you remember when you had measles when you were a child before they had the injection that prevented all that, and you could see the, the rash, the infection beneath the skin? Did your mother ever put you in a hot tub of water to bring it to the surface? You remember that. Put you in a hot tub of water to bring it to the surface. How many ever remember having a boil and you were suffering from it? And did your mother ever put a piece of fat meat on it to bring the boil to a head? You remember that. You remember that. You ever remember using ethiol, old black salve, that would bring again the head of the boil to the surface and that type of thing? Irenaeus, one of the so-called ancient church fathers, said that the law is a poultice to bring sin to its head. That was one of the purposes of the law. By the law is the knowledge of sin. But now add to that Galatians 3 and 24, wherein Paul says, Wherefore then serveth the law? And as that he says... The law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. So then what was the purpose of the law? This text says it was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Now, as you know, the word schoolmaster here in this text does not mean an instructor per se, but simply one, as it were, who would accompany the children to the place of instruction. So Paul is simply saying here that the law was our schoolmaster. The law was that one that accompanied us, as it were, to bring us to the master, to bring us to Christ. Now the theme of the entire Bible is that man can be saved, but that his salvation will be predicated upon Jesus, and that when all of that takes place, God will be glorified. Now, the Old Testament simply says that Christ, for whom that salvation will obtain, is coming. The New Testament says that that Christ, through whom salvation has come, indeed has come, and he will again come. So that then we have the theme of the Bible thus developed. That theme is developed from the historical perspective. So that this really is a sacred book of history. To be more accurate, it is his story. And instead of it having, as we accommodatively express ourselves, 66 books, we ought to say it has 66 chapters. The first chapter being Genesis, the second being Exodus, and so on, until you come to the last chapter, Revelation. And all 66 of these chapters historically develop what? The fact that man can be saved, one, it will obtain through Jesus, number two, and correspondingly three, God will be glorified. But if that's the theme of the Bible, you have got these 39 chapters the, of that particular book, 39 books as we commonly say, of the Old Testament involved in that historical development. That's why then we read in the book of Acts 10 and in verse uh, 38, that to him gave all the prophets witness, that's to Christ, gave all the prophets, Old Testament prophets witness, that whosoever believeth on his name shall receive remission of sins. What is Peter telling the house, Holy Cornelius? He is simply saying that the Old Testament scriptures indeed pointed toward, pointed to the coming of the Christ. That again was one of the purposes of the Old Testament scriptures. Yes, they were our schoolmasters. 
to bring us unto Christ. Now, having observed the inspiration of the Old Testament, having observed the purpose of the Old Testament, by the laws of knowledge of sin, the laws of our school master will bring us to Christ. We leave these and we observe, thirdly, the duration of the Old Testament. The Old Testament, in a discussion of that, may we observe first, was never intended to be a permanent legislation. Never. In the book of Hebrews chapter 7 and verses 8 through 13, we find the inspired writer quoting the book of Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. And therein this statement appears, in that he, Jeremiah, whom he is quoting, in that he, Jeremiah, saith a new covenant. And Jeremiah had sat back there 600 years before Jesus came. He said, Behold, the days come when I will make a new covenant. Well, now, what does the Hebrew writer say? In the Jeremiah 600 years before, and that he said, A new covenant, he, Jeremiah, maketh the first old. From the day that the old covenant was given, the passing away of it was beginning. Never intended to be a permanent legislation. Our Sabbatarian friends have been slow to get a hold of that point. Never was it intended to be an everlasting covenant. Now, that being true, we better appreciate 2 Corinthians 3 and 7, wherein Paul, talking about the old law that was given on Mount Sinai, says, which glory was passing away. Margin says, which glory was being done away. So from the very time the Old Testament was given, it started passing away. So never destined to be permanent. But now relative to its duration, we observe that the Bible teaches us that that Old Testament was abrogated and that at the cross. That it was abrogated, Ephesians 2.15 affirms. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make of himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Again, Colossians 2, 14 through 17 says, that Old Testament law was blotted out, taken out of the way, and was nailed to the cross. Galatians 3, 16 and 19 says, the old law was given till the seed should come. Galatians 3, verse 16 says, that seed was Christ, that seed Christ now has come, therefore the law has been abrogated. Galatians 3, 24 and 25 says, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But then he says, after faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. Galatians 1, 23 says that that faith has come. If that faith has come and the law was the last till that faith came, then the law no longer is existing as far as being binding upon men is concerned. Hence the book of Hebrews 10 and verse 12 says, he took away the first that he might establish the second. That's why we read in the book of Hebrews 8, 7 through 14, that Jeremiah's prophecy that the Old Testament would be done away indeed has come to pass. Hebrews 8 and verse 4 says, and also chapter 7 and verse 12, that there's been a change in the priesthood. There being a change in the priesthood, there is of necessity a change also in the law. We're no longer under the Levitical system, but under the Melchizedek priesthood of Christ, says Hebrews chapter 7. Therefore, that priesthood has been changed. The priesthood having been changed, the law is no longer binding. So what about the duration of the law? Never intended to be permanent. We now have seen that it indeed has been abrogated. But thirdly, where? Again, Ephesians 2.15 says, Having abolished in his flesh, underscore in his flesh, having abolished in his flesh the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Now that ought to have been sufficient. Here is the law. What about the law? It's been abolished where and how? In the flesh of Christ. But the next verse says that he might reconcile both, that is, you and Gentile, by Christ, might be reconciled both unto God in one body, watch this, by the cross. And then he says, having slain by that cross the enmity. Verse 15 identifies the law of commandments contained in ordinances as the enmity, and says such was abolished in his flesh. Verse 16 says that enmity that stood between the reconciliation of Jew and Gentile has been done away, and that by the cross. So then it was at Calvary that the law, my friends, was abrogated. Now, all of this being true, we can certainly make these deductions. 
that since the Old Testament has been abrogated, we need not look there to find the answer, back there to find the answer to what must I do to be saved, nor to look back therein to find out how to worship God, nor to look back therein as to how to live the Christian life. Why? It has been abrogated. The inspiration of the Old Testament. Purpose of the Old Testament. Duration of the Old Testament. And last of all this morning, the prophet of the Old Testament. That the Old Testament scriptures, though abrogated, are still profitable is affirmed in Romans 15, 4. Wherein Paul says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. That text simply says this, First of all, all the Old Testament is inspired. Watch the terminology. Whatsoever. The Bible doesn't teach partial inspiration. Whatsoever things were written aforetime. So you have the entirety of the Old Testament canon inspired. Secondly, these matters were put in written form. Whatsoever things were written. Thirdly, there is profit there too. But what's the profit? Were written for our learning. Therefore, one profit of the Old Testament scriptures is instruction. That we through patience, the term there means forbearance. We can read the Old Testament scriptures and we can be greatly encouraged to forbear under adverse circumstances, as was the case with Joseph and as was the case with Esther and as was the case with Daniel and so on. That we through patience and comfort, so the Old Testament gives us comfort. How strengthening to read. God is my refuge and strength. My very present help in trouble. That's Old Testament. Psalms 4 to 6, 1. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And so the Old Testament gives me hope. And thus I read. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That gives me hope. So I've got hope. And I've got patience. And I've got instruction. These being the three prophets to the things that are put in written form. But these things are put in written form as an entire Old Testament canon spoken of in the text as whatsoever things which are written for time. Now you have a parallel to that in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and in verses 11 and 12. And now in capsule form, what indeed is the prophet of the Old Testament canon? We suggest first of all that there are the studies of the Old Testament prophecies relative to Christ. And their corresponding fulfillment we can read about in the New Testament. And when these are observed, how our faith in Christ is strengthened. That's profit to Old Testament study. In the second place, we can read our Old Testaments and there we can have necessary uh, character qualities strengthened in our individual lives. I read about Daniel, I want to be more courageous. I read about Moses, I want to be more meek. I read about Joseph, I want to be more pure. I read about Abraham, I want to be more a man of faith. These Old Testament worthies exemplify noble traits of character that I need to incorporate into my own life and character. Then again, when I read my Old Testament, I get a knowledge of the nature of Almighty God as I can study very, very profitably His many attributes. And then when I read the Old Testament, I come to see the many types and shadows that are found therein. I read how that the first Adam is a type of the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4 to 9. I read how the tabernacle is a type of the church. Hebrews 8 and verse 2. The temple a type of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Israel a type of the New Testament church. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. So there I have this matter of typology. Type and shadow from the Old Testament. And now this morning we have observed the inspiration of the Old Testament. Some preliminary observations exhausting the possibilities affirmed by the writers, affirmed by Jesus, affirmed by the apostles, and substantiated through the internal evidence found therein. We next observe the purpose of the Old Testament by the law as the knowledge is said. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. 
With that observed, the duration of the Old Testament never intended to be permanent. It has been abrogated, and that at Calvary, and then deductions. And last of all, the prophet of the Old Testament. One, typology. Two, the fact that it gives me an idea and a concept of God. Three, establishes traits of character. And lastly, the prophecies concerning Christ. From the study of the Word of God today, then let us conclude that we will believe the Old Testament without reservation. We will appreciate the contribution that is made to the scheme of redemption. We will refuse to use it in establishing matters in New Testament Christianity. And then let us resolve that we'll study it with diligence and that with profit. It could be in this audience today that there are those who have never obeyed the gospel of Christ. He of whom the Old Testament prophets wrote and spake. And the need of your life is simply to respond as indeed a believer, having read and studied your Bible and without reservation, believing that indeed he is the Christ, the Son of God. Now letting that faith become operative, let it lead you to make up your mind you'll quit doing wrong and do right. That's repentance. Then be willing to sweeten your lips by saying, I do believe that Jesus Christ is a Son of God. And that to let it be known that you are a suitable subject for immersion. And then let us baptize you, let us immerse you into Christ. And that for remission of your sins, Acts 2.38, that God might write your name in glory and add you to the church you can read about in the Bible. If you're here and you've done that, but through the temptations of the world, you have fallen by the wayside. And you're out there in an old, cold, bleak, barren, lonely, desolate mountain of the sand. And you're miserable. And you need God. And you need Christ. You need the Bible. You need the church. Won't you come back today and be restored, saying, I've been wrong. I've left the path we have rectitude and duty. And I want my brethren to know that I'm coming home today. And let us put the arm of love and care around you. And hand in hand, let us march toward that not ending paradise of God. If you're here to need to become identified with a local group of the people of God, we pray it will be right here with us. We're going to sing the song that Brother Clark has announced. And while the angels of glory peer over the jasper walls to this very scene to see what disposition you'll make of the invitation of Christ that still says, Come unto me, will not to the rejoicement of heaven and the salvation of your own soul, will you not say, Yes to Christ. Yes to Christ. Even now. As together, we now stand and we sing.